cozy sci-fi fantasy. Everyone's new favorite subgenre. What joy is mine? I'm not sure that anyone could actually tell you what it is because as with all genres and subgenres, it's pretty nebulous. It's in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes it's, you know, actually shelved in the bookstore in a specific section. Other times it's just kind of like vaguely vibes-based groupings. This is more of a vibes-based grouping. So if you find it in a bookstore in its own section, it's probably like a table that's like, these are cozy fantasy books as seen on TikTok. You know how they do. I actually don't know how they do because I never actually physically go to bookstores. So as far as I can tell, my understanding of cozy fantasy, my experience of, well, cozy sci-fi fantasy, because it's both. I feel like people usually say cozy fantasy and then sci-fi is on the list also. Anyway, it's a big mess. But so what is it as best as I can describe it? I mean, it's kind of in the name, right? It's cozy. So in my experience, this tends to mean some or all of these things will be true about a book that is labeled as cozy, that it has low stakes or lower stakes. It is slice of life, which also is <laughs> pretty vague to, as far as I can tell, slice of life means like just day-to-day -day stuff going on that's like mundane. It's pretty casual about its world building usually and the relationships, be they romantic or otherwise, though often romantic, are more so the focus of the story of the book than anything else. So some examples of cozy sci-fi fantasy. Um, these I've tried to keep to examples that like I have read or have read some part of, so I can more confidently say this does or does not belong on that list. I have read or read part of all of the books I'm about to list um, and have seen them on lists of like cozy SFF. So like I, I'm co-signing saying I think it does belong on that list. So the big one that I think every there's universal agreement on in it is the what the secret history is to dark academia. Legends and lattes is to cozy fantasy. <laughs> then there's a house in the cerulean sea, a long way to a small angry planet, wizard's guide to defensive baking, Emily Wilde's encyclopedia of fairies, the London Seance Society, witch mark, a marvelous light. <laughs> So how I generally feel about these types of books, um, if you're a longtime viewer of my channel, then you'd probably recognize all the books that I just listed as also belonging on another list, that list being books that I dislike. <laughs> um, just the notion of cozy sci-fi fantasy has never appealed to me, and that's totally fine. Like, there's lots of genres that I am not the target audience for, and I do not require that all books that are written be written for me. <laughs> I mean, I have nothing against it in principle, I guess, there's probably genres that I'm against in principle, but I don't know, that seems weighted and loaded and that's not what this video is about. So yeah, like, it's like fine that it exists. Like I'm not, I guess I'm mad that like, if it's super popular and that means the majority of new books are that because I'm not interested in that. So that just means there's less new books for me to read. But like, it's fine, like it, that it exists, it's fine. <laughs> I have nothing against it. I It just does not appeal to me. My comfort read is The First Law by Joe Abercrombie. <laughs> and when I have read cozy SFF, it's almost never been my choice because again, I don't pick up books that I think I'm going to dislike. And if it falls into the cozy category, I think odds are pretty high that I'm going to dislike it. Once in a while, for a couple of the books on that list, I picked it up myself by choice no one made me because something about the idea or the premise or something I heard about it made me go, oh, that actually sounds like it'd be pretty good and then I didn't like it. <laughs> so having read either by choice or not a bunch of those books um, and found that I did not like any of them, it just kind of confirmed for me that yeah, my intuition about cozy fantasy not being for me was correct. It is not for me. But again, if people are happy reading it, then more power to them. If it doesn't hurt me at all, if people are enjoying books that I don't personally gravitate towards, whatever. Who cares? So why then am I going to be ranting about cozy fantasy? So as I said, when I have read cozy fantasy, it has almost never been by choice. And when I have read it, I have not enjoyed it. And again, that's totally fine. Plenty of books are written for readers that are not me. And the fact that people have different tastes and different interests to me, that is all to the good. But being the reader that I am, when I am made to read cozy fantasy books or cozy sci-fi fantasy books, um, I am not suddenly going to turn into a different type of reader. So when I am reading those books, I'm still going to be paying attention to things that I would normally pay attention to when I am reading a book. And things that I generally pay attention to include things like world building, internal consistency and logic, particularly as concerns the speculative, speculative elements, character building, themes, the prose, and in the cozy 
cozy books that I have read, it's not good guys. <laughs> but if it were simply that, that these elements are just poorly executed, that would certainly annoy me. That would lower my rating of these books. And when I was talking about them, I would call out those flaws, those weaknesses, um, those gaps in them. But again, I wouldn't film a whole rant about the genre if that was it. I'm ranting because a lot of cozy books, they aren't just poorly executed, in my opinion. They are executed so thoughtlessly as to make them actually offensive. So I, I'm mostly not going to give plot specific examples um, because that would be extremely spoilery and also would necessitate me explaining kind of like the whole plot or the whole setup of whatever book I'm talking about. And like that is beyond the scope of this video. I'm not here to like recap an entire book for you just so I can tell you what was wrong with this part of it. That's just too much and that's... No. So in cases where I have spoken in depth about these books, then I will point you in that direction if you do want to hear more specifics about like the plot, the spoilers, whatever it is. There is one book that I've never talked about anywhere, so I will give a spoilery bit of information about that one, but I'll warn you when that's happening. So if you don't want to be spoiled, then you can click away. So broadly, without spoilers, the three books that I'm going to mainly be talking about and using as examples for what I'm talking about as a problem are A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers, Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies by Heather Fawcett, and The London Seance Society by, I think, Sarah Penner. Didn't write it down. All three of these books, they started out as simply dull, uninteresting, you know, not my vibe, <laughs> not my kind of book at all, but they ended up eliciting actual rage and disgust from me. And the problem, as far as I've been able to diagnose it, stems from this very casual approach to world building in this subgenre. <laughs> The problem with most world building, or the problem with bad world building, I should say, um, is that the author has failed to think through the implications, the ramifications, the effects of the whatever they've set up. So generally with like high fantasy, grim dark fantasy, hard sci-fi, things like that, those types of sub uh, subgenres, the non-cozy SFF, this results in plot holes, it results in shallow feeling worlds, it results in a, a that they're lacking a feeling of authenticity. It's kind of like a um, like a world building equivalent of the uncanny valley, by which I mean the book is telling you that this is how this world works, but you as the reader are like, yeah, but the way people are acting just like doesn't gel with that, with what you've told me is supposedly true about this world. It like just doesn't fit like, and it just doesn't feel like that's how that would go. So it's not a plot hole. It's just like, like with the Uncanny Valley, it's like the vibes are off. Like this doesn't, this doesn't go. That's not usually something that would lead me to feel enraged or disgusted. Brandon Sanderson's Warbreaker being the notable exception. <laughs> if you want to see why I feel that way about Warbreaker, um, I do have a review for it on my Patreon, um, but I also talked about it with Bookborn on Bookborn's channel when she made me read it for our TBR swap, so um, I'll leave relevant links down below. But in any case, I'm here to rant about cozy fantasy, not Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> so in the case of cozy books, like the ones that I listed, Long Way to Small Angry Planet, London Seance Society, and Emily Wilde's uh, Encyclopedia of Fairies, I felt like, and again, I haven't spoken to the authors, but I felt like the authors thought that they did not need to truly engage with or grapple with or think through the implications of what they had set up. And so they treat everything fairly casually because, you know, this is cozy fantasy, cozy science fiction. But if a reader actually thinks through like what they are suggesting, what it would mean for the premise that they're describing to be real, the implications are horrifying. So starting with Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies, this one actually is a slightly different from the other two. I mean, they're all these three examples offer three different ways that this goes badly, I guess. Anyway, um, Emily Wilde's is slightly different in that it's less the implications of like the internal like book itself, like by itself in a vacuum, although I have issues with that as well, but that's not really the thing that disgusted me. So like I have lots of problems with that book, but the thing that got it a place in this video that, that enraged and disgusted me is more to do with the cavalier attitude the author has towards the real world history that she has taken, like her the myths and stuff that she's used in her world building. Um, and so then the way those concepts are employed in the story, the way, like, if you think about it in the context of what 
this actually came from in real life, like where these myths came from, like what people were really doing that resulted in these myths or the reason these myths came about or whatever, then the, what she's doing with that like speculative concept in her book is really gross and disgusting to me that she would choose to do that in that book, given where these uh, where these stories and ideas came from in the first place. So like instead of um, in, in the case of like things that are like m myths and legends and things from our world, um, if they stem from something kind of problematic, I think with some exceptions probably, but I think you have to be kind of careful with that. And I think it also behooves you to, if you're going to really super duper be relying on that in your world building or in your storytelling, that it behooves you to kind of unpack, interrogate, and be in conversation with the real world things that surround what you're pulling from, if that makes sense. Because again, I'm being vague and not giving spoilers. Um, the video where I will talk about this in depth is not up anywhere yet. I have filmed it or I filmed part of it, but I haven't filmed all of it and that's why it's not up anywhere. So there will be <laughs> um, uh, footage that's like full spoilery for me talking about that. It doesn't exist yet. If I remember then when that video eventually exists, then I will link it in the description of this one, but that won't be for a little while. <laughs> but yeah, suffice to say, for the case of Emily Wilde, lots of things that I hate about it. But the thing that is gross to me is the thing that is to do with like where she has pulled this myth from or this this lore from in the real world and what she's doing with it in her story that kind of like reinforces some really gross ideas um, which were present in the real world. That's where this came from. And I just, I don't understand how you can call yourself a cozy book when you're leaning on, drawing from, and not bothering to interrogate something so heavy and gross. I just, excuse me? Uh, next, Long Way to a Small Airy Planet by Becky Chambers. Let me count the ways this offended me. <laughs> this book enraged me, like in a way that I was not prepared for. I had avoided reading it because I didn't really think it would be for me. Because again, I don't think that cozy books are for me. Not because they'll offend me, but because they're just not like, of interest to me. Every two seconds the book would say something twee about togetherness or sameness or some such whatever, um, but the way it would do so or the parts of its world building that it would be kind of referencing or or engaging with when it was doing so, I say world building loosely, <laughs> made the implications of that twee statement horrifyingly offensive and disgusting and, and it was made all the worse by the twee and cozy tone that it was taking with all of this stuff. Like if characters are going to be saying things that are kind of, to be frank, fucked up, um, they better be doing it in the context of a morally gray story, a morally gray world, morally gray characters, where I as the reader can assume that I'm not meant to take what they are saying, what they are doing, the positions espoused by this part of the book, um, as being good. The fact that the book is shelved as cozy, as cute, as nice, as whatever, um, that makes these vile sentiments so much more disgusting because it's basically giving them a stamp of approval. It's saying by being in this book and having these characters be all tra -la, la when they're saying these things that are truly fucked in my opinion is that's what makes it gross. Like if, if a first law character is saying this stuff I'm like oh well yeah because we're making a point about how that's messed up just like this character is messed up. But no, it's in a cozy book where the characters are cozy and sweet and this is supposed to be like, oh, what a cute little book that I can just like not be stressed about. I am extremely stressed because the idea that people are reading this and don't have a problem with this and in fact think these concepts that are being talked about in this way are fine, um, that's going to make me lose sleep <laughs> because no, what? No, no, absolutely not. Um, as to where you can see me rant about this book, um, so I read this, again, not by choice, I read it for my patrons in a patron vlog. It feels weird to me to be like plugging it um, right here and referencing it and then continuing to paywall it. Um, but I also feel like it's not fair to patrons who have paid for it um, to just like make it public. Um, so my compromise is that um, I'm going to make it um, public for two weeks. So it's linked in the description if you want to see it. Um, it is an hour and a half long. <laughs> since the two weeks because you know I ranted for an hour and a half that is not an insubstantial amount of time so yeah for two weeks um it's available to anyone to look at and then after that I'll put it 
back to patrons only. Um, that seems the most fair thing to do because I don't want to film a whole separate public video about this just for this. Don't I talked for an hour and a half like I do not want to have an hour and a half section of this video <laughs> to rant about all of those things. Um, anyway, so that's my solution. Um, but yeah, suffice to say, if you don't want to see all that and you don't want to look at the video or if you've missed the window, um, yeah, it just it, innumerable are the ways in which it went out of its way to just be so offensive. <laughs> I was completely shocked, honestly, that people are fine with that book. Like what? And lastly, The London Seance Society, which is a recent read. Um, so I only just finished it. And that's the book that put me over the edge. <laughs> it is the reason that I finally decided to do this video. So there's nowhere else that I've talked about this. This is the world premiere of my opinion on this book. So there's nowhere else for me to point you to to watch me talk about it. So this is the part where I am going to talk about spoilers. So if you don't want to be spoiled for anything that happens in that book because you are interested in it or whatever, then I will, uh, when I start talking about spoilers, I will mark spoilers um, and I'll give you a timestamp to skip to if you do not want to see the spoilers. Like for basically every other cozy, cozy book. Um, it started out just being really boring, really dull, really uninteresting, not my cup of tea. And I frankly didn't care enough about anything that was going on to pay that close attention to anything that was going on. I wasn't really paying attention to the nonsense world building or to the nonsense characters or to the nonsense story because it just was not my thing at all. And I wasn't vlogging it or planning to review it so there was no real reason to like nitpick it or take note of anything. And I bring this up to say that I wasn't really looking for things to discuss. Like I wasn't purposely like like, oh, I gotta find the thing about it because I need to have content or whatever. Like, I was pretty cat. I started, I was like, I don't think I like this, but it's pretty short. So, and I got it from the library. So I was like, I'll just, whatever, I'll listen to it on the way to and from work and whatever. We'll, we'll get through it. So I, there's probably a tons of stuff in there that I missed that would also enrage me, but I missed it because like, I wasn't paying that close of attention because I didn't care and I didn't like it and wasn't planning to talk about it. Um, This is when we're going to start to get into spoilers. This is not full spoilers, but it's a bit spoilery. The book started to give me the ick when I realized that one of the perspectives was actually supposed to be like the villain, like capital V villain. And that perspective in question, I mean, it certainly wasn't terribly virtuous, <laughs> um, but maybe because I'm a first law girly, that was the only part of the book that I was even mildly enjoying. This character actually had like a little bit of depth and nuance to them for me to kind of chew on. <laughs> so when I realized that I was supposed to be like despising them and rooting for the other characters, I, I'm pretty sure I audibly groaned. But that's still not the reason this book got a spot in this video. <laughs> oh no. It's the ending. So full spoilers now. Um, if you don't want to see any spoilers for this book, you know, skip to whatever timestamp I have put somewhere on screen. This book is about seances. That's in the title. Our protagonist doesn't believe in spiritualism nonsense. But she studies under a medium because she's trying to figure out what happened to her now dead sister because her sister was like looking into this stuff and she died. I think, again, I wasn't paying that close of attention. I think she died um, not just while investigating this stuff, but I think she died like at the scene of a seance or something like that or adjacent to a seance or I forget. But like seances were a thing she was into and she's dead now and probably murdered and like sister wants to figure that out. And uh, boy, let me tell you, the way the book goes about explaining to our protagonist why her doubts about spiritualism are like actually super silly, um, that she's being so close-minded. Um, it was honestly kind of rage-inducing in and of itself. The audacity to point to fossils as evidence to support the existence of spirits remaining after death, I have no words. But anyway, so the villain POV is from this eponymous seance society. The dead sister, I think she, she had gotten like close to him because she was looking for information. You know, she was trying to use him to dig up dirt on the seance society. And long story short, in the end, we learned that the society has been basically like blackmailing and extorting money from people and also like committing the odd murder to keep their their business of extorting people um going and obviously you know that's that's bad <laughs> and so our villain pov the one that i was like you're actually kind of interesting <laughs> he was like an accessory to this so like he like knew what was going on and like kind of like helped facilitate some of that happening. And so during the climactic like final seance battle whatever confrontation our protagonists end up not just killing the villain pov um, but also trapping his spirit in lingering eternal limbo torment or something like that, basically. And they do this on purpose. And is this treated as being weighty? 
Is it treated as being kind of fucked up? No. Our protagonist is like, well, we did go through a hell of a thing and my sister's still dead, but you know, at least we trapped that guy's soul forever in torment. So, you know, job well done on that at least, tra la la. And we even get a, a final POV of him post death in lingering spiritual torment. Like, um, excuse me? <laughs> Our own justice system in the United States, which by most measures is pretty messed up, it does not permit cruel and unusual punishment. Again, we can talk about how the justice system often fails to actually like prevent cruel and unusual punishment, but like, on paper, in principle, our justice system is like, no, cruel and unusual punishment, we're not about that. That's not justice. And the death sentence itself is extremely rarely used and is widely frowned upon. I personally am 100% vehemently against the death penalty being used ever. That's not what this video is about. But point being, like, just, just killing, just death by itself, no torment, no, like, cruel and unusualness about the death is like, even that is like, mm, I don't know about that. But in this cozy fantasy book, our protagonist sentences the villain whose crimes are being an accessory to blackmail and covering up a murder to eternal spiritual torment and treats it as, well, that's a job well done. That is so deeply fucked up. Like that would be fucked up in a serious high fantasy grimdark fantasy book. But in a cozy fantasy book? Like are you fucking kidding me? What is wrong with you? <music> cozy fantasy authors, you are not exempt from thinking through the ramifications of what you have written just because you are shelved in cozy. In fact, you should probably be more careful to make sure that your book actually is cozy and not actually super duper fucked up. Because these cozy books being all twee and sweet in their language while talking about really awful things, um, it's giving Harley Quinn and not in a good way. So let me know in the comments down below your favorite cozy fantasy books and why I'm completely wrong about the genre and why the three that I talked about today are actually your favorites. And I'll see you in my next video. Bye.